All right, the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. We'll begin reading in verse 8. We finished 8 to 13. We'll look at 14 through 17. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He looks forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake, and he said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, and the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Verse 14, O my dove that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our, excuse me, for our vines have tender grapes, my beloved is mine, and I am his. He feeds among the lilies until the day break and the shadows flee away. Turn again, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. Father, thank you for your word again. We pray for lessons from it for our hearts as we consider once again uh, love and its uh, display between humans, and then also between God and his church. We pray in Christ's name, amen. So we have in verse 14, that appears to be 14 and 15, seems to be a continuation. In verse 10, she said, my beloved spake and said to me, and uh, it appears to be a continuation there in 14 of him speaking and then about the foxes as well. In 14, we seem to have his longing and his desire. And then verse 15, his concern and protection, uh, kind of stewardship going on. And then verse 16, her confidence in a covenant love that they have. And then also her longing and desire in 17. So 14, seems to be his longing and desire, and then 17, hers as well. In verse 14, he says, O my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places or in the holes of the rock. Let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely or beautiful. Adam Clark writes that he is comparing his bride hiding herself in her secret chambers and closets to a dove in the clefts of the rock. A comparison made to show the longing that he has for his bride and that they're not, the, the wedding nuptials haven't taken place yet and so she is hidden away as it is in her home and uh, he is longing for her. And he, and he says, let me see thy countenance and hear your voice, for sweet is your voice and your countenance is comely. This love, which is moving toward a covenantal love, it's moving toward the marriage uh, vows, becomes attached to one face and one voice. Each person has a fingerprint of sound. It's amazing how many different people you can actually recognize by just the sound of their voice. Um, in all the world. I'm sure there's duplicates out there somewhere among the seven billion, but you can, hundreds and hundreds of people you can know and recognize just by that voice. There can be an appreciation for other voices and other countenances, but here we have a covenantal love attaching itself to one special voice and one special countenance or face. 
the one who would be lawfully theirs before God forever. So, and, and, and it's what human beings long for. They desire uh, special friendships. They long, pe most people want to have at least one friend who is very special to us, whether it's in a marriage relationship or if someone is not in a marriage relationship or even called to be single. There still is usually within that desire to have someone who's very special to us. So her sight and the sound of her voice does something for the beloved. When he says, let me hear your voice, sweet is your voice in your countenance, it's comely. So, and that's what, you know, lots of poems are written about and people have experienced the fact when they enter into or are heading toward a covenantal love, an intimacy where one is set apart from all others, that when that is taking place, they, they can sense even, I don't know what it is because I am not a scientist, but there's a chemical reaction or something that takes place when you hear that voice or you see that countenance, it's different than seeing other people or hearing other people's voices and the associations that go on in the mind and uh, a kind of oneness in the soul. So there's emotions and affections and sensations that take place. And so we have here uh, the beloved uh, longing for that, longing to hear the voice and see the face once again. In verse 15, he says, in verse 15, um, if you look at all the different translations, it's attributed to all kinds of different ones. This was to the brothers, this one was to the maids, this one was to somebody else. So there's a, there's a lot of debate about who this was told to, but it appears to be told by the beloved, by the groom. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. The commentators do seem to come to a conclusion generally about this verse though, even though they don't always know exactly who it might have been said to. Kyle and Dalich said, this is a wine dresser's ditty in accordance with the Shulamite's experience as the keeper of the vineyard, which in a figure aims at her love relation. <clears throat> um, Clark writes, these, were, these foxes were ruinous to vines, all the authors allow. Eaten in autumn in some countries, they abounded in Judea and did most damage when the clusters were young and tender, which they are at this point within our text. The bridegroom to his companions as he is entering into the apartment of his spouse is how Clark views it, that he is longing for her and he is coming to see her. And then as we know, the Shulamite had vineyards. And as he comes in, then he is speaking this perhaps to those who would be helping tending her vineyard. I remember when we were studying Genesis 20 years ago, thinking about Jacob who loved sheep and tending sheep. So when he shipped off to, to go find a wife in Haran, he comes into Haran, he finds Rachel and falls in love with Rachel. She's a shepherdess as well. But also he immediately begins to, he begins to uh, tell the shepherds what they ought to be doing there. They're, 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 it's noon, they ought to be resting their sheep. And he's, he goes on with this because it was in him to do it. And so I think of that with um, the beloved here who has been pictured to us often as a shepherd and how the picture seems to be that he has come, he's longing after her and then he's giving instructions to those who are attending the, the vineyards to be careful because of these problems, the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the grapes. So love takes an interest in everything that's related to the loved, to the one loved. So here he is, this is her, his beloved, his Shulamite. She has a vineyard and he sees an issue and he's telling them, be careful, be careful, the foxes are out now, 
You don't want to ruin the, the young grapes that are out. And that's the way that love is. Love does take an interest in everything that's related to that person. It's concerned for the one that they have set their love upon. And it also shows in the beloved a good stewardship as well because he's caring for uh, everything and all these little things and the little destructive foxes. And there's lots of little things that can damage fruitfulness. What little things, you know, in our lives do we have to watch over that could damage relationships? So we see in the, in the beloved uh, a faithfulness and a stewardship. Kyle and Dalich go on to say this aiming at her love relation, the vineyard beautiful with fragrant blossoms point to the covenant of love and the foxes, the little foxes, which might destroy these um, vineyards point to all the great and little enemies in adverse circumstances that threaten to know and destroy love in the blossom of it ere it reach the ripeness of full enjoyment. So, and it's what we tell couples to, you know, as we give them premarital counseling and postmarital counseling. And, you know, when you're first, we see this in this idealized love and this overflowing love toward that person to not forget to keep doing the little things that you did when you were wooing and winning that person to yourself because it's important, because it's the little foxes that spoil the, the, the grapes, the vineyard. And then in our text, he goes on, as she goes on, now she says, my beloved is mine and I am his. And he feeds or shepherds among the lilies. And here's the words of the bride upon the bridegroom's entrance, as it were. And it's an idea of ownership. And we would say soul ownership when we're talking about something covenantal that was coming up um, for them. When she says, my beloved is mine. The wedding vows, uh, an old wedding vow that we have is we promise to have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold. To have means to possess, to belong to someone. And it is that wonderful security of being wanted and needed and connected to another human being. It's the formation of family, the first institution God created for the benefit of mankind. Marriage is the possession of a relationship. To have, to have, to possess something and to hold, to retain it, to embrace it, to keep it. We promise to keep our family together despite the inevitable forces of a fallen world, our sinful natures, and an evil world system which will try to wrench the relationship from our grasp. We promise to hold on to one another. So he is acting the part that he should as a good steward. She is saying and coming to this firm conviction in her own soul that my beloved is mine and I am his. So she's, she's ready for this covenant relationship. She's entering into this sense that they do belong to one another. And, and these, are, these are the words, of course, of God in his church as well, very, very, very much covenantal language. And it says he feeds among the lilies or he feeds the flock, that is. It's the idea of shepherding. He feeds the flock among the lilies. Barnes says he pursues his occupation like a shepherd among the congenial scenes and objects of gentleness and beauty, of gentleness and beauty. Until the day break, verse 17, until the day break and the shadows flee away, Turn, my beloved, and be thou like a rower, a young heart upon the mountains of Bethur. Until the day break and the shadows flee away. Different things are given to these words. Some see it as the evening time, um, the, the, but I don't quite understand that with the idea of the day break. Um, I, I think I rather see it as the sense that this shepherd, you remember Jacob, what did Jacob say about his shepherding? It said that he was with the sheep when 
It was night and day, right? It was night and day. He was with them around the clock. You were with your sheep. When you were out there, you were in the field. He said the dew was on him in the night and the uh, sun was on him in the daytime. And so what appears to me, uh, if, if I'm correct, in this poetry, she, in uh, verse 14, has been talking about how, or he in, in verse 14 is talking about how he has been longing to see her. And, and then she, in verse 17, until the day break, here is throughout the night, he is away and he is with his flock. He is shepherding them among the lilies and the shadows flee away. That is the shadows of the night. Those are the shadows that are the most frightening of shadows. Some could say there's only shadows in the day, but there's not, there's shadows at night too. And sometimes those are actually more frightening than those during the day. My beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bethel. She, she keeps talking about him being the roe in the heart that comes leaping and bounding to see her. So either way, um, obviously she is doing the same thing that he did, longing, longing and desiring to be with him as well. Well, when we apply and make the analogy between Christ and his church in verse 14, O oh, my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock of the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. For sweet is your voice and your countenance is comely. We would say that we have the call of God in the scriptures. God, Christ calls to us to show ourselves to him he calls us to prayer. He calls us to expose our souls to him. He, he desires in the scripture to hear our voice in prayer. It is a lovely thing to him to hear us being dependent upon him, giving praise to him, thanks to him, all these things. And indeed, we are taught by the Holy Spirit, pray without ceasing. God says, pray without ceasing. Uh, as if we could say he would always hear our voice. That verse 14 would be something that he would always be saying. He would always be saying, let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet to me. In James, it says in James 5.13, for the afflicted, are you afflicted? Let them pray. Are you sick? Call for the elders and let them pray. Do you have faults with each other? Pray for one another. So there's all kinds of praying going on, whether you are praying yourself, having elders pray over you, or praying for each other within the church itself. How did we know that Saul had become Paul? How did we know that Saul was converted? The Holy Spirit says in the book of Acts, behold, he prays. <laughs> behold, he prays. He has come to know God, and God is hearing his voice now. So. We are to uh, let our countenance come before God, that is, our souls come before God, that God could see us for who we are, poor sinners, but under the blood and with the righteousness of, of Christ upon us, so that prayer and praise and listening to the word, God would hear our voice. God would hear our voice, and that's a wonderful thing. John Gill, in his exposition, he writes, O oh, my dove, it's an epithet sometimes used by lovers and is a new title that Christ gives to his church to express his affection for her and his interest in her and to draw her out of retirement, to go along with him. The dove is a creature innocent and harmless, beautiful, chaste, sociable, fruit, fruitful, weak and timorous and swift in flying, all suitable to the church and the people of God. They are harmless and inoffensive in their lives and conversations. They are beautiful through the righteousness of Christ upon them and the grace of the Spirit who is in them, and they are clean through the word. Let me see thy countenance, Gill says, or face. And he encourages her to appear more publicly in his house and courts for worship and present herself before him, and look him full in the face, with an open face, behold his glory, and not be shamefaced or fearful, not to be afraid of anything, 
but come out of her lurking holes and be seen abroad by him and others since the stormy weather was over and everything was pleasant and agreeable. For sweet is thy voice, pleasant, harmonious, melodious, having a mixture of notes in it as the word signifies. And so it exceeds the voice of the dove, which is not very harmonious. He says, pleasant and delightful to God who loves to hear his people relate the gracious experiences of his goodness and speak well of his truths, give the amen, and ordinances. Prayer is sweet music to him, to him. And then in verse 15, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. So our Savior would teach us, would teach us to be careful and circumspect concerning those little things. Thomas Scott writes a whole section on it, but then he says, it is a caution against everything, he says. It's a caution against everything, however plausible, which tends to hinder the prosperity of the church and the fruitfulness of individual believers against heresy in particular, but whatever, whatever wastes time, whatever squanders your money or engrosses a large share of attention or tends to the neglect of the means of grace is of this kind. And when the pursuit or study is not directly criminal in itself, but it spoils the vine and mars the tender grapes, with the unsuspected subtlety of the fox, the first rising of sinful thoughts and desires and the beginnings of those trifling pursuits are like the little foxes, which if they're not taken, they're gonna spoil the vines. Trifling visits that waste much time, incur at great expense, put the mind out of frame for devotion, intrude on the hours that should be employed in meditation, or self-examination, or searching the scriptures, or secret prayer, are peculiarly injurious in this respect. And no good can arise from unnecessary uh, talking with worldly people or with superficial professors whose company will not help you on to God. So the little foxes, the little foxes. But then it goes on to say, but my beloved is mine and I am his. My beloved is mine and I am his. Once again, Dr. Gill. These are the words of the church who having had such evidences of Christ's love to her and care of her expresses her faith of interest in him and suggests the obligations that she lay under to observe his commands. The words are expressive of the mutual interest that property in Christ and his church have in each other. Christ is the church's by the Father's gift of him to her, to be her head, husband, savior, gift of himself to her, to be her redeemer, ransom price, and by marriage, uh, he is the husband and she is the wife in righteousness and loving kindness, having espoused her to himself. So even as she longed to see him, a lot of the commentators speak of us in our longing to see the Lord yet again until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn again, my beloved, and be like the roe or the young heart upon the mountains of Bether. It could be spoken of the darkness of spiritual darkness. It could be spoken of that a situation of soul in which we're looking for revival in our souls, in which we need him to come back, come back bounding to us, show yourself to us again. It could be spoken of those who are getting on in life and they're looking for that time in which uh, the darkness of this world and our pilgrimage here is going to, to break away and the shadows flee away and go into eternal glory. Um, but either way, we see that the church loves the covenant that she has with the Lord. My beloved is mine. And that's the assurance that we long for and look for and is established by understanding the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. My beloved is mine and I am his. And that's really the essence of salvation, isn't it? It's the return of our souls to God and to where we're joined again in union with Jesus Christ 
where we are redeemed, where there's no longer enmity, where there's a reconciliation, a friendship, an adoption into the family, all kinds of pictures that God gives us in salvation to describe communion and restoration and oneness, this covenant oneness. My beloved is mine and I am his. And he shepherds, he shepherds among the lilies. He is the great shepherd who brings us into uh, calm waters and green grass. And we look for him. We look for him from Sabbath day to Sabbath day. Lord, please speak to me again uh, through your word and help me in the worship to truly worship you and commune with you in the singing and in the prayers of the saints. And let these distractions, all these little foxes go away so that I can be reunited with you once again in the worship. That's what we desire. Our Father and our God, we thank you. Thank you for your precious word and the beautiful love story that you give to us between the Shulamite and her beloved and the analogy that you give to us between our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the greatest of shepherds and the greatest of husbands, the greatest of lovers, who has wooed our soul and brought us to yourself by your word and by your spirit. And we pray that each one would know that uh, love and that belonging to Jesus Christ, which can satisfy our deepest needs and our deepest longings for the closest friend, the friend of all friends, really the only friend that we can completely unbosom ourselves to of all things and know that he graciously receives us by his shed blood and by his love that he has determined upon us. And so we pray that you would, that you would come and that you would revive our hearts always uh, through the preaching of the word, through our own study of it, through our praises to you, through the prayers in all things, Lord, that you would come bounding over the mountains to be our uh, love, to see once again your countenance, your face, and to hear your voice. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.